Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I don't know what to call this, but uh, I guess in a way you could say I almost hate one verse church people. Well, I shudder to call them Christians, so I don't know. Stay, bear with me. I, I've got a point to make. John 3.16, the most, probably the most known verse in the Bible. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, according to these one-verse Christians, everybody that believes in Jesus is going to not perish and have everlasting life. Well, I wouldn't say that's entirely not true, but is there a condition on whosoever? Hmm? Well, let me ask you a question. What about Satan? Does Satan believe in God? Does Satan believe in Jesus? Is Satan saved? And the answer is yes, yes, no. Satan absolutely believes in God. Satan absolutely believes in Jesus and knows exactly who he is. Is Satan saved? Absolutely not. Go to the book of James, chapter 2. Let's start reading in verse 14. James had a father named Joseph and a mother named Mary. And he lived with a guy named Jesus. So I think he knows a little bit of something about following his brother. Well, technically, when uh, you technically don't have a father and, well, I, I don't know. Uh, all I know is Jesus had the same mother and father as Adam. So, all right, but James grew up in the same household. So, he knew Jesus his whole life. Verse 14, James asks, What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Does Satan have faith in God? I mean, does he believe in God? Oh, absolutely. Verse 15, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, in other words, they're they're freezing and they're slowly starving. Verse 16. So, well, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Oh, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? You got five coats in your closet? Four of them you've not worn in five years? You're not going to take a coat out of your closet and give it to them? Give them some clothes to wear so they're, they're warm? You got a bowl of stew on the stove and you're going to throw half of it in the garbage because you can't eat it all? And you're not going to give a bowl to them? And you call that faith? And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? What good is your faith if you don't put it into practice? Verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. You see, you're not saved by your works. 
but your works are proof that you are saved. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without, without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. John 3, 16, Whosoever believeth in God shall be saved, right? Verse 19 of James chapter 2. Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. See, right here it tells you, Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. See, the devils believe in one God. Absolutely. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Are the devils saved? Because they believe in God? Are they? Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 9. We're going to read part of this chapter, and this is going to prove to you that the angels, even though they believe in God, even though they believe in Jesus, they do not have salvation. So John 3, 16, even though it says, whosoever doesn't apply to them. Verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Not angel, man. For it became him by whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, not angelic. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Listen to verse 16 carefully. For verily he, who is he, Jesus? For verily he took not on him the natures of angels. You see, angels' angelic nature, Jesus didn't take on the angelic nature. There's two ways of looking at this. One, Jesus didn't become an angel. He didn't take on the nature of angels, but his blood sacrifice does not apply to angelic nature. It doesn't apply to them. It only applies to flesh and blood. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Oh, wait a minute. I thought... God, Jesus took on the, the, the whole world. But the Bible says he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wait a minute. But he says he loves the whole, the, whole, the whole world. But it says right here, the seed of Abraham. Hmm. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, 
to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are temper, temp, tempted. Okay, that uh, Jesus didn't come to take on the nature of angels. He came to take on the seed of Abraham. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 21. Little background here. Abraham and uh, Sarah were old. And, you know, I think she was 90. And how many 90-year-old women do you know that get pregnant? So Sarah said, all right, well, we've got this Hagar, which was their bondwoman, a servant. And uh, Sarah told Abraham, go in under her and have a, you know, have a son, and that'll be our child. And uh, so Abraham did. Hagar was an Egyptian woman. So he had a child. His name was Ishmael. The modern-day Arabs claim descent by Abraham via Ishmael. So, let's go to Genesis chapter 21 and go to verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived, 90 years old, right? For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah would have given children suck, for I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast, feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. So here it is, Ishmael, the son of Abraham, the son of Hagar, the woman, the Egyptian, is mocking Sarah's son. Mocking him. Verse 10. Wherefore she, who? Sarah. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. In other words, get rid of this pe these two people. Get rid of them. I don't want them here. They're not going to be heir with my son. No way. Out. Verse 11, And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken or listen. Hearken under her voice, for in Isaac, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. You see, the um, the Muslims will say, oh, that's not true. Ishmael was to be the promised seed. And of course, the Jews claim that they're the children of Isaac. But in John 8, 44, Jesus said they had a different father says, oh yeah, you're Abraham's children, but your father is somebody else. You could read John 8, 44 and keep reading to the end. But, uh, you know, God said to Abraham, don't let it be grievous in your sight because of the boy, you know. And, but listen to her. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make 
a nation because he is thy seed. See, God blessed Ishmael, but he was not to be the promised seed. Isaac was to be the promised seed. In, in Romans 9, verse 7, it says, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Hebrews 11:18, Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Do you know that, uh, you know, Isaac had uh, two children also. He had Jacob and he had Esau. And guess what? God rejected Esau, rejected him. So just because you're a child of Abraham, that doesn't mean squat. In Genesis 17, 19, And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. This is God speaking. Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Where does it say, oh, I'm going to establish my covenant with the whole wide world? For God so loved the world. Verse 21. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, and Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. In Genesis 25, verse 24. Uh, this was Isaac and his wife, Rebekah, were getting, uh, they, they had children. You know, when people quote to me the New Testament, and they've never even bothered to read the Old Testament, never bothered to read Genesis, never bothered to read anything except for John 3.16, God so loved the world that whosoever believeth on him, well, you know, the devil believes in God. The devil believes in Jesus. So, you know, there's actually people that have told me that Satan is gets saved. Really? Genesis 25, 24. And when her days, Rebecca, and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Now, this is Abraham's grandchild, okay? And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. So he was 60 years old. Uh, so he had twin sons, Esau and Jacob. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, Hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Now, I did a Bible study on why God hated Esau. And the so-called black Hebrews will love to point out, oh, Esau was white. God hates whites. Well, you know what? If, if Jacob and Esau were twins... And Esau was white. What color do you think Jacob was? And oh, by the way, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Yeah. Jacob had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. Hmm. So how did God feel about Abraham's grandson, Esau. Well, how about Malachi 1 and verse 3? God speaking. Well, let's, let's, let's take a look at the... Uh, we'll start from the beginning. I don't want anybody to accuse me of pulling verses out of context. That's the job for the Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm sorry. So, all right, go to Malachi verse 1. 
the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel, that's Jacob, Jacob's 12 sons, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And then there's people who say, well, you know, the, that word hated there, it's mistranslated. What it really means is God loved Esau less than Jacob. Really? You know, there's uh, in the, in, in, I forget if it's in the Proverbs, but it says, these six things does the Lord hate. You know, feet that be swift, the running to mischief, hands that shed innocent blood, uh, a lying tongue, a proud look. Oh, I guess God loves those things less, right? No, he hates those things. And he hated Esau. Romans 9.13, as it is written, Paul confirms, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Esau intermarried with the Canaanites. Oh, you think God's being um, harsh? How about the book of Obadiah, one of the minor prophets? Minor in size, not in importance. Obadiah, verse 1 and 8, and uh, I'm sorry, chapter 1 and verse 18. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. You know what stubble is? It's worthless stuff that you burn. And the house of Jacob, which is Israel, right? And the house of Jacob shall be a flame, and the house of Joseph I'm sorry. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire. And the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them. There shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. For the Lord hath spoken it. Did you catch that? And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. For the Lord hath hath spoken it. Bingo! You know who's probably the most famous Esau Edom person in the history? Well, according to Josephus, a Jewish historian who lived around the time of Jesus, King Herod, you know, the guy that slaughtered all the children in Bethlehem trying to kill Christ, he was of, according to him, he was of the tribe of Esau, who was Edom. Is it true? I don't know, but I believe it. Oh, for those of you who think I'm uh, not telling something here, Genesis 32, verse 28. And he said, an angel, it's an angel speaking. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons. How about Genesis 35.10? And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. So, did God make his covenant with the whole world? What about Esau? God hates Esau. He says the house of Esau is going to be for stubble, and there's not going to be any of them remaining. So, did God love the whole world? John 3, 16. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's go back to John chapter 3 and verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a denomination of the Jews. All Pharisees are Jews. 
Not all Jews are Pharisees, but all Pharisees are Jews. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi. Now, people will tell you that rabbi means teacher. That's only, that's a half truth. Rabbi means master. And, and wouldn't a master teach you? Yes. So Nicodemus is showing Jesus honor by calling him rabbi. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Oh yeah, Nicodemus, he is a teacher come from God, but you don't know the half of it. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. The Jews didn't get that memo. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What? We got to be born again? What? But I thought it was just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, the devils believe in Jesus Christ. Are they saved? No. Were they born again? No. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth, bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting God, life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Somebody send the Jews a memo. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name, in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What name is that? Yeshua HaMashiach? I don't think so. My Bible says, Jesus and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And for every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Go to the, to the book of Matthew. Chapter 1, verse 19. Mary is pregnant. 
Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of in her is of the Holy Ghost. Hmm. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua HaMashiach? No. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You see, an angel of the Lord gave him his name. Who has the authority to change that? The Hebrew roots people. Oh yeah, let's go back to the Hebrew. Let's go back to the law. We don't need grace. Go back to the law. You see, basically they're denying the words of God. Yep, John 3, verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And that name is Jesus. All I know is Satanists, witches, and the Jews hate the name Jesus. Jesus. They hate that name. Devils tremble at the name of Jesus. Don't let anybody ever tell you that name is not good. It's going to be the name above all names. All right, let's take a look at Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law. Ooh, Torah keepers. I guess you ought to read Romans chapter 3. Oh, that's right. They say Paul, who wrote this, is a false apostle. Ah, okay. Now you, I get it. Okay. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it says here that, you know, all that believe, for there is no difference, right? And it says, for all have sinned, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, does all mean all? Well, let's find out. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, starting in verse 12. Does all mean all? Let's find out. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. See, God's word can divide the soul and the spirit. It's not the same thing. You know that there's a soul and a spirit, and you have a body. So you have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. That's three parts. Do you know that you were made in God's image, and you are three parts to make up one person? Hmm, think about that the next time. People tell you about the Trinity being a false heathen 
satanic doctrine. Yeah, when they when they turn to three into three separate entities, yes, but you know, people have a body, a soul, and a spirit, and it, it, yet it makes up one person. So, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. What? What? It says, but in but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You see, Christ didn't have any sin. So what about that verse that says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Uh, did Jesus sin and come short of the glory of God? Well, all means all, Pastor Bob or Bob, Chaplain Bob or Reverend Bob or whatever they call me. I don't call myself a reverend. That's a name. Believe it or not, reverend's the name of God. But it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it says, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You see, Christ didn't have any sin. If he did, we have no Savior. So does all mean all? No. It doesn't mean all. Does, does Satan get saved? Because he believes in God? No, absolutely not. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, boldly unto the law? No. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that wonderful? All right, let's go to Romans chapter 5. I guess we're going to read probably the whole chapter. There, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's me. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended, commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible. For God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, not by Torah keeping, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. See, wrath, tribulation is not wrath. 
Tribulation comes from the world, comes from Satan. God's wrath is going to be fire, people. That's going to be God's wrath. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Take a look at that word, atonement. A-T, at, O-N-E, one, mint. We're at one mint with God through Christ. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, and that's Adam, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's why the virgin birth is a very important doctrine. You see, Adam sinned, and death passed from Adam unto every single one of his descendants. That's why... That's why, I, you know, I know Mary carried Jesus in her womb, but I don't believe that G Mary's DNA was used for Christ. He wasn't half human and half God. I think the Holy Ghost gave him both sets of chromosomes. Because it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Did Christ sin? No. So, for that all have sinned. So, all didn't sin because Christ didn't sin. you got to realize this all is talking about mankind. Christ was mankind, but he was God in the flesh. He was Emmanuel. You've got to judge things by their context. When they, so, when people tell you all means all, no, it doesn't mean all. Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there, when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who is the figure of him that was to come? Now, he, he was the similitude. It means he was similar to. Who was Adam's mother? Who was Adam's father? Well, Christ is called the second Adam. He had the same mother and father as Adam. Think about that. And he had to be, because if he was a descendant of Adam through Mary, and Mary had the sin nature in her DNA, that would have mean Christ was born a sinner like us. So that's why the virgin birth I, I'm probably not explaining it very well, but, you know, there's people that understand it and explain it better than I do. But, you know, Christ is called the second Adam because he had the same mother and father as Adam did. And God, uh, Adam is called the son of God. But Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. There's a difference. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who is the figure of him that was to come? But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many." And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they 
which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men, all men unto justification of life. Does all men apply to Esau? God said he hated Esau. You think heaven's going to be full of people that God hates? I don't think so. I don't think so. So does all mean all? No. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, that's me, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. In Luke chapter 3, verse 38, we read, it's doing genealogy here, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. You see, Adam, Luke calls Adam the son of God, but Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. All right, let's take a look. Uh, I think we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to take a look. I think we're going to read this whole chapter. I'm not sure. All right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1, Corinth was a city in Greece. There was a church there that Paul had established. And he's writing a letter to them. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I, what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered... Unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That people is the gospel. And that he was seen of Cephas, that's, that's Peter, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. In other words, they're dead. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. Paul calls himself the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me, Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Oh yeah, they, they, that heresy is alive today. Verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, risen then, our preaching, then is our preaching vain, which means worthless. 
And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also is vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so, be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But then uh, Paul sticks the knife in the heart of this heresy. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all, does all mean all? Are the angels? Are those that don't believe? Hmm. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Well, yeah, everyone will be. Uh, even the wicked will have a resurrection. It's called the white throne judgment. And it's at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. Some people call it the millennium. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order... Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end. You see, when Christ comes, it's the end of this world. Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are at Christ, that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Oh yeah, now that part of all I believe. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Isn't hell and death thrown uh, into the lake of fire? Oh yeah. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. You see, there's an exception there. Christ isn't going to put himself under his own feet. I hope you catch that. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. You can't put yourself under your own feet. Okay, so... He's accepted. Accepted is the root word from the same root word that means an exception. Okay? All people can get married except those that are already married. That would be called bigamy, and that's illegal in the United States. Okay? So there's he, he's not going to put him, his own self under his own feet. Not going to happen. And when all things, except for Christ, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest... I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If I, I'm sorry, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, hmm, two-legged beasts, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage 
advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Yeah, what, what good is life if the dead are not going to have a resurrection? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Oh yeah, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. You ever heard that expression? If the dead rise not, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. For some men will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool! That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. See, you, you plant a seed in the ground, and unless the seed is destroyed, the wheat's not going to come up. You know, the seed has to be destroyed for the wheat to grow. That's just the way it is. Verse 38, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies. Those are spirit bodies. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Terrestrial, uh, the root word where we get terrain, it, it, it basically means earth. You, you've heard of, uh, that's rough terrain, you know, mountains are rough terrain. Well, bodies terrestrial, that's earthly bodies. So there's heavenly bodies, there's earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There was one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. See, if you're in Christ... Your body's sown with corruption, but when you're raised, you're not going to have a body of corruption. You're going to have incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Listen carefully. And people will tell you, you, the Torah keepers and Hebrew roots deceivers will tell you that Paul is a deceiver that wrote this kind of stuff. I mean, give me a break. Who do they work for? They work for the devil. Verse 45, listen carefully. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Hmm. See, Adam was the first man. He was made a living soul. The last Adam, who's the last Adam? Christ. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Verse 48. Well, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, there are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Praise God! 
Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, ye must be born again. You've got to be born again of the Spirit, people. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, somebody send the pre-tribbers a memo. We're changed at the last trump. Trump, not Donald, sorry. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Where's the last trump? In Revelation, there's seven of them. The seven trumps are judgments of God. By the time they get to the sixth one, the earth is almost destroyed. When you got seven trumpets, guess which one is the last one? Uh, number one, no. Number two, three, four, no. Five, six, no. Number seven, yes, you got it. Number seven is the last trump. And guess what? Number seven is at the end of the tribulation. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immorality, then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? I believe that's in the Psalms. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. You see, the law is the strength of sin. And what do the Torah keepers and the Hebrew roots people want to do? They want to make sin strong. Uh, no thanks. I think I'll take grace. What do you think? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be... To God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that ye as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Praise God for that. All right, well, I was gonna make this a short Bible study, but it ended up being an hour again. So what can I tell you? All glory to Christ, and God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.